Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kim Christensen. And I'm Jennifer Meckles. Tom Green has the day off. I hope you found some AC today because it was hot. Temperatures soared above 90 once again. The second day for 95 degrees this week. And this is really early. We haven't even made it to the official start to summer yet. Across Denver, people went in search of any place they could to cool off, splash pads, Confluence Park, places like that. On top of the heat, we have some scattered storms that are popping up again. Doesn't look like it in that picture, though, Kathy. <laughs> right thank, there. Thank goodness, right? Yeah. <laughs> but wait till this time tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I think this time tomorrow we will have some scattered strong storms right over the metro area. Today, we're tracking isolated severe storms on the far eastern plains. We had a weak cool front come in, did little to cool us off. 96 degrees, our new high in Denver. We're down to 93 now, 105 in Pueblo, 10, actually 102 in Pueblo, 105 5 in Lamar, 98 in Grand Junction, 91 in Greeley. Winds are picking up as well, so fire managers on their toes as winds are picking up and the gusts are in the 35 to 40 miles per hour range coming in out of the east and northeast on the backside of that front, triggering some convection in eastern Colorado. We're outside the severe thunderstorm watch, but they're traveling on I-70 eastbound outside of Lyman, Flagler, and Burlington. They contain one-inch diameter hail and damaging winds, so we're watching that closely. All is well in the metro area for now. We don't expect an overly active evening, but we're still in kind of that level one area for severe weather threat here in the city between now and about nine o'clock. So we're watching the skies pretty closely. When we're in a marginal risk, it means wind and hail would be the biggest threat. Tornado threat is very low. Always lightning, something we talk about with these storms. Temperatures in the mid 90s now dropping into the 80s coming up by about nine o'clock tonight. And your weather headlines will continue to track the severe storms on the eastern plains. The heat continues today but cooler weather comes in tomorrow along with showers and potential severe thunderstorm activity. We'll talk all about it and the timing and impacts just ahead. An abandoned campfire led to the Interlochen fire burning near Leadville. That's according to a U.S. Forest Service investigator. New pictures show that campfire on the trail. Investigators say the campfire just wasn't put out correctly and it continued to burn and spread days later. The fire remains at zero containment. The size increased to more than 470 acres today. More than 100 firefighters are working on the ground and in the air helping to fight that fire. Today we also spoke to several visitors who were camping at the Red Rooster watching the fire grow right in front of them. Check out these photos. Candace and Mikey Nickerson shared them with Nine News this morning. The couple and their kids were camping on Tuesday when the fire got going. They were across the lake giving them a front row seat as they watch the flames grow. To see the flames, what we guess about 100 foot tall at that point. It was something out of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, it was just, surreal. Just one big burst after another, after another, just covering the hillside, kind of right there with interlaking right in the foreground. It was, it was absolutely nuts. The craziest thing we've ever witnessed. The U.S. Forest Service believes the person that left that campfire unattended left it several days before the fire started. The Lake County Sheriff's Office and U.S. Forest Service have now opened up a tip line hoping to find that person. We've got that number on your screen, 303-275-5266. If you know what happened, please call that number. As fire operations continue, we'll be bringing you updates on air and online. You can see the latest information by downloading our free 9 News app. We continue to cover updates in the deadly crash on Highway 285 from Tuesday. Colorado State Patrol says that driver of the semi-truck now facing multiple charges, including driving a commercial vehicle without a valid commercial driver's license and vehicular homicide. Tuesday's crash shut down lanes in both directions near Schaefer's Crossing. That's between Conifer and Pine Junction area. They were shut down for 14 hours. CSP officials say speed was a factor in that crash. The man killed was identified as 64-year-old Scott Miller, and at least one other person was seriously hurt. Now the driver that is charged is scheduled to be in court next Tuesday. Here in Denver, the city continues to see migrants arrive from the southern border, just not nearly as many as earlier this year. According to the city, the Den Denver has helped more than 42,000 people since 2022. 
Yesterday, they counted 21 newcomers, none reported so far today. As migrants make their way here, the city's helping hundreds with a new kind of program. It's called the Work Ready Initiative. The goal is to put these migrants through training so they can eventually get a job. Nine News reporter Lauren Scafidi is here to break down how it works and the exciting tool they were given today. Very exciting. They clapped and cheered as they were all given computers. So grateful for the gift that hopefully just keeps on giving, first with training, later with jobs. The city says they hope that the move creates a pipeline of people who will be ready to support themselves in just a few months. These are more than computers. Vamos a, a poner acá nuestro nombre, teléfono y firma. Okay? They're means for migrants to create a new life in America. Aquí tiene su computadora. Denver says the city's new work ready initiative Felicidades. will help serve fewer people in a better way. Eliana Jimenez Emocionada por todo. is grateful to be one of them. She came from Venezuela in April. The AT&T Foundation gave the laptops. Centro de los Trabajadores is making the curriculum for English and computing. And Community College of Denver is hosting the classes. Me va a ayudar en mis clases de inglés, en, en las otras capacitaciones, si tengo que ver clases, clases virtuales, en eso me va a ayudar mucho. A deep con with the city says the goal is to give migrants the skills, training, and certification they need to get a job. For us, this is an opportunity to invest in individuals who can help us grow our economy and also get on a path to self sustainability. It costs about $3,000 to put each migrant through the six month program coming from the city, state, federal, and philanthropic dollars. ¿Quién hace falta por computadora? For the 350 migrants enrolled, it's all free. Lo mejor que podemos hacer es aprovechar la oportunidad que nos están dando para... Now that Eliana has the tools... Esta computadora va a ser para ustedes el inicio de este gran proyecto. She's ready to use it to fight for the future she came here for. Trabajar duro, por supuesto, eso. Por eso queremos las capacitaciones, porque a eso venimos, ¿no? A trabajar duro. Computing and English class classes officially start on Monday. The city says they also had migrants starting their asylum applications at another clinic today. There's a 150-day mandatory waiting period before they can get work authorization. Live in the studio, Lawrence Cafiti, 9 News. But they want that work. This oh, yeah. This is exciting. This is a big step. Yeah, they're ready to work for it, that's for sure. All right, thank you, Lauren. So this is the time of year when the U.S. Supreme Court starts dropping decisions for the season. The first ruling that sides with the company of Starbucks in its labor dispute with a group of employees trying to unionize. Those employees are known as the Memphis Seven. They were fired after trying to unionize their store in Memphis, Tennessee. The high court's decision could make it harder for the National Labor Relations Board, a federal agency, to temporarily halt unfair labor practices, including firing workers involved in unionizing efforts. The court said that the standard the relations board was aiming for would make it too easy for the government to win in every conflict with an employer. Also today, one of the first major rulings on an abortion-related case since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court justices kept access to a widely used drug for medication abortions. NBC's Bree Jackson explains what this means. In a unanimous decision, the high court kept wide access to the drug Mifepristone, one of two drugs used in nearly 66% of all abortions last year. That means patients can receive the drug through the mail without an in-person doctor visit. The case stemmed from a Texas judge's ruling last year to move Mifepristone off the market. The group of anti-abortion doctors claimed the FDA did not properly vet the drug back in 2000 and put women's health at risk. But the Supreme Court froze that order until it heard arguments last March. During those oral arguments, the government argued that the anti-abortion group had no standing to bring the case and that Mifepristone had been on the market for more than 20 years with decades of evidence to prove the drug was safe. At the time, justices appeared to side with the government on this standing issue, even those who ruled to overturn Roe versus Wade. The Biden administration and the drugs manufacturers also argued that taking Mifepristone off of the market could undermine the FDA's drug approval process. More than six million people have used Mifepristone since 2000 as part of a two-part drug regimen to end pregnancies.
And this is not the only abortion case on the Supreme Court docket. The justices heard arguments in April over whether a federal law on emergency treatment at hospitals must include abortions, even in states that have banned abortion. Justices have yet to rule on that case. In Washington, Bree Jackson, NBC News. Coming up at five o'clock, we're hearing from a local nonprofit on what this ruling means for abortion access in Colorado. New this afternoon, Senate Republicans blocked a bill to make federal protections for in vitro fertilization nationwide. Democrats are trying to enshrine the right for individuals to receive IVF treatment, as well as make it more affordable. Democrats also tried to get the same thing for abortion. That measure also failed.